So let's do a short recap of chapter 14. We just concluded chapter 14 last week. And in that chapter, we know that God was continue, continuously instructing us through his word concerning the transformation of our lives in Christ and in handling church conflict. So God is always instructing us on what to do in order to please him. We discussed that church conflicts should not cause division and that we have to learn and need to learn to agree to disagree. We're not all the same. We're all different. We have different opinions, but those opinions should not be something that divide us. So any conflict that is happening should be handled with love. Any conflict that's happening now or that may happen in the future, it should always be handled with love. We have to also remember, we were reminded in 14, Romans 14, that we are weak in some areas and some areas we're strong in. And those areas that we're weakened or maybe strong in, we should not judge another that may be weak or strong in that area. In other words, we should not look down on those people because on that person because they're weak or strong in an area. The kingdom of God is more important than food and drink. We also discussed that because there has been a lot of issues and it continues to be an issue on what you should drink and what you should eat or what you can't eat or what you can't drink. And that has caused a lot of division in the body of Christ. So in this chapter, Romans chapter 15, Paul is continuously, he's still talking. This is Paul that will continue to talk and to instruct us and to encourage us. And he's talking to us and he's reminding us that those who are strong are to receive and to bear or put up with the infirmities or the weaknesses of those um who are weak in the faith or who are weak in the, in the body of Christ. So concerning uplifting the weak, we got to remember that when Christ, Christ came and he died for us and he was unselfish, he walked in unselfish love. He loved us unconditionally. He went to the cross for each one of us and he accepted us just as we are. When we came to Christ, we were a mess. We were messed up and some of us are still a mess. I'm still being worked on areas that Christ is still working on me and that I continuously seem to fail in those areas. I keep getting tested and it seems like I keep failing, but I keep trudging on. I'm not going to allow the enemy to cause me to sit down on Christ or to back up because I know that the gain is much better than what I am giving up. So we also, in this chapter, we're going to see the value of the Old Testament scriptures and how valuable they are to us. And to, we're also going to see that we need to be with one mind and one mouth. That means with one voice. That means speaking the same thing, glorifying God the Father, the true and living God. We're to receive one another to the glory of God, just as Christ received each one of us. We're also going to see where Paul prays. He prays that God might fill the people, fill us, fill those that were listening to the letter, those who were listening to the letter at the time, and even now us in this day and hour. He has prayed that God might fill us, fill them, fill us with joy, peace, and believing so that we may abound, so that we may abound in hope with the help of the Holy Spirit. So verse one of Romans chapter 15, it says, we then who are strong ought to bear the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. So scruples is a feeling that prevents you from doing something that you think is morally wrong. So it's your strong belief. That's what scruples is. It's your strong belief about what is right or what is wrong. So we then who are strong ought to bear the scruples of the week, those people who think that something is morally wrong, and we might think that it's okay to, to, for that particular thing. We might think it's okay, but for those who think that it's morally wrong, we should not look down on them. We should not um, say things to them that's going to belittle them or that is going to cause them to lose hope, lose faith, and to back away from Christ. So those who are strong in our convictions, in your convictions and faith, patiently endure, 
patiently endure, patiently put up with those who are weak, those who are weak in certain areas. We need to put up with them. We need to have patience with them because we got to realize that God is patient with us. Even in our weaknesses, he's still patient with us. He's still helping us. He's still enduring. He's still working with us. So we've got to also be patient with those people. And we've got to always examine ourselves to ensure that what we are doing or not doing or what we're saying or not saying, make sure that those things are not going to tear down the brother or sister in the faith. So Romans chapter 15, verse 2 says, Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. So we've got to practice pleasing our neighbor. And our neighbor is anyone. It doesn't have to be somebody that lives beside you. It doesn't necessarily have to be someone that might be in the same apartment building or same complex as you. Your neighbor is anyone. So we need to practice pleasing our neighbors, pleasing those believers in Christ for the good. We need to practice building them up, building him or her up in the faith, in the faith of Jesus Christ. Then in verse 3 of Romans 15, it says, For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. So Christ is our example. He didn't please himself when he came to this earth, when he came in human form, he always stated, I came to do the will of the father. Then he says, whatever I've heard the father say, those things is what I say. Whatever I saw the father do, those things I do. So Jesus is our perfect example because he didn't please himself, but he considered the needs of others. He considered your needs. He considered my needs. He considers the needs of those that will come after us, those that went, came before us. And his consideration of our needs led to salvation. He knew that we needed to be saved. So he came to earth. He put on flesh and he came to earth so that he can walk out the life as a human. Even though he still was God, he walked out the life of a, of a human so that he could redeem us to God the Father. So Jesus humbly, he humbly, he was obedient. He went obediently to the cross. Even though when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he, he sweated great drops of blood. And I will, and I looked that up some time ago and it stated the medical field states that you can be under such stress. You could be under such stress and such concern that the blood vessels in your body can rupture and open up. And instead of a sweat coming out instead of water coming out you will actually start sweating blood so even in the garden of gethsemane and he knew what he was going to have to go through he obediently went to the cross as a servant so he loved you he loved me so much that he came to introduce salvation even to those neighbors even to those people that did not love him. Even to those people who will never come to love him, he still died for them. He still died for them, even though that they hate him without cause. So he said, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. So he's talking to God, the father. He said, those who reproach you, those who express disappointment and disapproval in you, father, he said, they fell on me as the son. So that's what he's talking about when he said the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. He's talking about the reproach that fell on God the Father. The, the reproaches, the disapproval, the disappointment fell on God the Father. He said the reproaches in him fell on him as the son. So as I was studying this and I was looking and I recall back when I was in middle school and there was a principal in the middle school that I was in and because she did not like my mother she didn't care anything for my mother it was something that happened during the day with me and another student but she decided she was gonna paddle me and only me so i got a message to my sister who was at the time substituting i said call my mama and tell her come out here right now so when mama came out there she addressed this principle and I didn't get paddled. So the reason I was going to get paddled was because she did not like my mother. So she was trying to take it out on me. So I understand what Jesus was talking about when he said the disappointment, the disapproval towards the father fell on him as a son.
So then in verse four, when you read in scripture, find yourself in the scripture, find how it relates to your life, how it relates to your life now, or how it will relate to your life in the future. And a lot of things we can handle a lot better. Then in verse four, it says, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So written in times past is talking about those things that have been written in the Old Testament, those things that are written in the New Testament, those things that are written for us, they're written for your learning, they're written for my learning, they're written to give us instructions so that through patience and endurance, that means the power to withstand any difficult, unpleasant situation. These scriptures are written to give us that stamina to be able to stand against whatever comes our way without giving into it. There's so many temptations that come our way, but when we look at the scripture, we see that we can have the, the power to withstand because once you read the scripture, the Holy Spirit then has something to bring back to your memory when you go through a situation or even before you go through a situation. He can bring things back to your mind that will encourage you to be able to withstand any difficult or unpleasant situation. That's just like someone that's running a marathon or someone that's in some type of sporting events that requires a lot of stamina. In order for them to be able to handle that situation, they actually have to train for that to be able to run um, those miles, run 20 miles or whatever it may be, or in the ring box. And they actually got to condition their bodies to be able to handle the stress or the situation that they're going to go through. So that's what we got to do. We've got to get into the scripture. We've got to learn the scripture so that when time comes, we can be able to uh, with, pull from our bank of knowledge of what we've learned in the scripture in order to be able to encourage ourselves to push ourselves to go on forward to not give in to the temptation to not give in to whatever it is that's trying to lure us into doubt unbelief to try to lure us away from god so these scriptures are given to encourage us to help us to withstand any situation they're given to give us hope to give us comfort because when you read the scriptures it should bring you comfort and encouragement it should provide knowledge to you to be like-minded just like christ in our dealings and service towards others how we're able to deal with other people is through the scripture the scriptures will actually encourage you will actually settle you when you have to deal with certain people that may be difficult they may not want to listen the scriptures will help encourage you when you think about hebrews 11 1 when it tells us that now faith is now faith is this very moment that you call upon faith the very moment that you have to activate faith for that situation is now faith is a substance of things hoped for and is the evidence of things i seen. things you're hoping for but you don't see you're hoping that this person will cooperate but you don't see it so you're hoping that god will move on their heart because he has a king's heart in the palm of his hand that he will turn it towards you so that you will get the desired outcome. So Philippians 2, 5 said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's another scripture that will give you hope because when you go through a situation that is mentally exhausting, mentally taxing, but when you think about this scripture, Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, that will give you the strength to be able to go on. That will give you the strength to be able to cast that worry, that concern over to God to let him handle the situation because you're letting the mind of Christ. See, when Christ walked the earth, he wasn't concerned about what people said they were going to do to him or what they thought they could do to him because he had the mindset that I came to do the will of the Father and nothing that these people say is going to affect me or keep me from doing what my Father wants me and needs me to do. So he allowed the mindset of heaven to be in him. He kept that same mindset to be a servant, to be obedient to the Father. And that's what we got to do. We got to let the mind be in us, regardless of what the people on the outside say or think they can do to us. We got to let the mind of Christ be in us, knowing that Christ has the power and ability over us. When we relinquish our life to him, he's able to make things work out for our good. 
And then Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When you go through a situation and you see mentally and visually, you see that it's hard. It looks hard. It looks like I'm not going to be able to accomplish the mission. But then when you think about this scripture, Philippians 4.13, and you remind yourself, I can do all things through Christ, through Christ who strengthens me, only through Christ who strengthens me. I can get this done. I can accomplish this. I can go back to school. I can pass my exams. I can take the driver's test. I can pass the driver's test. I can do whatever it is. I can uh, pass this bar because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because I'm giving him glory, honor, and praise. I know that he's going to help me, that he's going to give me what I need in order to pass. So as we go through trials, as you go through trials, as you go through unpleasant situations, stand and allow the Holy Spirit to bring back to your memory God's promises through Christ. See, when you allow the Holy Spirit to bring those things back to you, it builds your confidence. It builds my confidence. It strengthens me spiritually. So the knowledge of scriptures, it affects our attitude. If you notice, you could be having a bad day and you read a scripture and it just immediately lifts you up. It it lightens you. It causes you to smile. It causes that, that weight to lift right off of you when you read that scripture and then you say it out loud and then you can just see and feel in the spirit the whole atmosphere of where you are will shift. It will change because that's what the word of God does. It's powerful. So if you have any type of addiction, if you have any type of pain, speak God's word. It may not change right that very moment. It may and it may not. But even if it doesn't, keep speaking it and believing and trusting God. It's just a matter of the body lining up with what God's word says. The body is always going to be in rebellion because it doesn't want to do what God's word says. That's why when you're reading or studying the word, you get sleepy. It's because the body doesn't care about God's word. This body is going to be in the grave. And our spirit man that's on the inside wants to keep on, but the body wants to wants to stop. It wants to lay down. It wants to go to sleep. But our spirit man, once this flesh is in the grave, our spirit man is going to go on and God has got a new body prepared for you and prepared for me, for all those who love his appearing, to all those who have received Jesus as Lord and Savior. That right there is enough to make you want to shout. Just knowing that this body that you're in now, you don't, you're you not going to have to deal with this body one day. You ain't going to have to deal with, deal with the aches and pains and stuff like that. So what God has done in the past should build our confidence and let us know that what he's done in the past, because he is no respecter of person, that he will also do in the present and in the future in your life. So then in verse five, it says, now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is Paul's prayer. He's praying, he says that the living God who is patient, God is so patient and he's long suffering. He says, I'm praying that he will give you endurance. He says, I'm praying that he will give you encouragement and provide you with comfort, that he will grant you the ability to be like-minded, to have the same mind as Christ, that you will be patient with each other because sometimes we lose patience with each other. I know I'm guilty of it, lose patience with each other, and I have to call myself back to the carpet when I see that I've gotten a little quick-tempered or short-tempered. I have to call myself back to the carpet and realize that I've got to be patient just like God is patient with me. I have to be patient with others. And Paul said, and that he will provide you comfort and encouragement so that to, you will have that same attitude towards your neighbor, those who need to be comforted, those who need comfort, those who need encouragement, that you will have the same mind, uh, same attitude and same mind that Christ has and that you will live in harmony with one another. So the NIV says it this way, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't want to be self-pleasers. We don't want to be arrogant. We don't want to think more highly of ourselves than we should. 
but we want to be with one accord. We want to be with one mind to glorify God. And how do we get with one mind and one voice to glorify God? That means we've got to get into his word. We got to be reading his word, studying his word, activating his word, walking in his word, applying his word to our life so that we can have that same mindset of Christ, so that we can have that same voice as Christ saying the same thing, giving God praise, giving God honor, giving God adoration, giving God thanksgiving. See, by doing this, when you do these things, you don't have time to be little. We don't have time to be little somebody or hate somebody or backbite or devour or humiliate another individual because we're too busy glorifying God. We're too busy trying to please God by helping our neighbor, by building up our neighbor, our brother or sister in, in the body of Christ. So the more you know, the more I know about the word of God, the better off we will be because then we will know what actually pleases God the Father, and that then we will take aim to please him. See, when we study God's word and we read it out loud, God's word is a seed and our heart is the soil. So as we read in his word, that word is going back into our hearts and it's getting into our minds. And then the Holy Spirit has something to bring back to our memory as we walk on in this life. So those things that you read, those things that you heard from scripture, the Holy Spirit can bring back to your uh, memory. So therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God, verse seven. So our command is to receive those who are strong and those who are weak in the faith. And we're to receive them. See, when Jesus received us, he received us in the state of sin that we were in. He received us even when we were ignorant of the law, we were ignorant of scripture. That means we had no knowledge of the law, had no real knowledge of scripture. He received us just as we are. We came to him just as we were with the hopes and expectation that he could do in us and through us what we could not do for ourselves. So we are dependent on him or we were dependent on him. So we've got to receive others just as Christ received us so that God will get the glory. So let's do a self-examination. Are you one who tries to build other people up or tear them down? That's a question that you ask yourself so that you can do a self-examination. You can ask yourself, am I one who, who builds people up or am I one that tears people down? So then the next question you can ask yourself, are you one who seeks an opportunity to help others regardless of their strength or weakness. Do you see somebody and you say, well, <laughs> that person is strong in the faith or I'm not going to help them. So are you one who is judgmental? Are you one who just thinks, okay, if that person is strong, I'm not going to help them. Or if that person is weak, I'm not going to help that person. So examine yourself. And then next question is, do you look to point out the wrong of other believers? Are you one who sit back and try to scrutinize and take your little notebook out and start writing down people's names and where they're weak at or where you see them sinning or what have you? Do you look to point out the wrongs of other believers? Remember that how you judge others, you'll also be judged. So keep that in mind. Then in verse eight, it says, now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. For this reason, I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. So, Jesus became a servant to the circumcision. We know the circumcision to be the Jews. The reason he became the circumcision or servant to the circumcision was that so God's truth, God's truthfulness will be known. It will be confirmed. It will be settled. The promises, the vows that God made to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the vows that he made to them, the covenant that he made to them, when he made this covenant, because there was nobody greater than God, he swore by himself that what he said, what he spoken will come to pass. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So Matthew, I go John 10, 16. Jesus tells us in John 10, 16, he says, and other sheep, talking about the Gentiles, 
I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock. He was in the anticipation of salvation here. That's what he's talking about. There will be one flock, anticipation of salvation of the Gentiles, and the formation of the church body, which consists of the spiritual bodies of both the Jews and the Gentiles. So he said, and there will be one shepherd. So he was anticipating and knowing that salvation was going to be brought to the earth through his uh, death, burial, and res resurrection, that this was going to happen. So he became the servant to the Jews to confirm God's promises. He wanted to demonstrate God's mercy to the Gentiles so that they might glorify him. So whenever you see somebody that has done something good, we tend, as people, we tend to give them praise for the good that they have done. So because God brought mercy to the Gentiles, we glorify God because realizing that we have been saved from evil, danger, and destruction. We've been saved from eternal damnation. So we give God glory. We give him honor for what he has done. So as it is written, it was declared in the Old Testament, in the law, in the prophets, and in Psalms, as well as Moses, David, and Isaiah declared God's mercy. They declared that God would demonstrate his goodness for the purpose to bless the Gentiles through Israel. See, he came to Israel, to the Jews first. He came to the uh, blood-born Jews first. And because they rejected, it was all in his plan. He knew that they would reject Christ the Messiah, but he would still use them in order for the, the word of God to get out to the Gentiles. Then in verse 10, it says, and again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles. I'm sorry, let me go back. It says, for this reason, I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. So proclaiming the victories of God to the nation, this was a call for the nations to respond uh, to God in faith. So Paul is citing this verse because it's an ongoing intention of God to bring salvation to all people. So this is still happening. When the gospel goes out to everybody, when everybody has had an opportunity to hear the gospel at least one time, that's when Jesus will return. God promised that everybody will be have an opportunity to hear the gospel at least once. There's no guarantee that you will hear the gospel two, three, four times, but he said you gonna everybody would hear the gospel. So then in verse 10 it says, and again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. So in Deuteronomy 32, 43, this chapter is the song of Moses. This song was given to Moses, and it is inviting all nations to join in worship, to praise God for the promise he has given to us to restore justice, for the promise he has given to us to for redemption. Then in verse 11, it says, and again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, laud him or exalt him or glorify him or proclaim him, all you peoples. So Psalm 117, and this Psalm is so short, I breeze over this thing so many times and didn't even realize how short this was because when you're reading and you keep reading and, and you go on to the next chapter, you just they just all flow so well. So Psalms 117 is the shortest psalm and it has only two verses, but these are such powerful verses. And this is what it says. It encourages us to praise the Lord. All you Gentiles, Lord him, which means glorify him, proclaim him, speak well of him, all you people, for his merciful kindness is great towards us. God is so merciful. If we lived to be a billion years old, we would not ever be able to thank him enough for his mercy, his goodness, and his grace. And then it says, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. So God's truth will always endure. Then in verse 12, it says, and again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles in him, the Gentiles shall hope. So when it talks about the root of Jesse, this is the title of Jesus, the Messiah. See, Jesse was the father of David and 
Jesus is the promised Messiah who came from the uh, David. So Isaiah 11, 1 and 10, it talks about the exalted root of Jesse will attract the Gentiles. So because Jesus came and he died for all mankind, he is drawing us to him because of his love, because of his mercy, because of his grace, because of what he has done. Verse 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So when it's talking about abound, it means that we may flourish or be prosperous in hope. So Paul's prayer is that God, the God who gives hope, the God who gives confidence, the God who gives the expectation or anticipation that through him, we will be filled with joy. To be filled with, with joy, we will be uh, rejoicing that we will have a feeling of great pleasure and happiness and peace, that we will have a calmness, a restful, restfulness in the mind. I love the scripture that says that there remains a rest for the people of God. I look forward to that day when I will be able to rest in the Lord. Well, I won't have to have another care in the world. I won't have no worries, no concerns or anything. I look forward to that day for the rest in God. So as you believe, as you accept the truth, as you accept the truth by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, what came to my mind, what God brought to my mind when I was studying this is that there are false prophets and these false prophets, this antichrist spirit that is out there, he will do things that will cause people to hope, their hope to be stirred up. He will cause them to have a peace, but it is a false peace. This antichrist will come and he's going to offer to the nations He's going to offer to the nation what he calls a peace treaty. And this peace treaty is only going to last for a small amount of time, a small portion of time. So because God offers peace, God offers joy, God offers hope, God offers us the opportunity to believe, then the Antichrist always comes and he counterfeits whatever God does. He comes and he tries to demonstrate through his wordiness, which means the lots of words that he will speak. He's going to deceive many people and people are deceived right now. There's people that are doing all kinds of sin, but yet they think it's okay. They're trying to say they got peace, they got joy, they got hope, but there is no peace or hope or joy apart from the spirit of the living God. So in my opinion, and this is my opinion, that because these people are walking in this falseness that they think is joy, peace, and hope, that they're being led away from, further and further away from God. They're on this wide road that is leading to destruction. So then in verse 14, it says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to also to admonish one another. So Paul says, I'm convinced, I'm positive, my brothers and sisters. This is what he's saying that you yourselves are full of goodness, you are full of integrity, you are filled with the knowledge, the intelligence, the wisdom, and competent. That means they're skilled, they're experienced enough. He said, I believe that you are experienced enough to instruct and teach each other, that you're experienced enough to train and direct one another. That's what he's saying. So then in verse 15 and 16, he says, nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. Sometimes we have to repeat stuff to people because they seem to have forgotten or they try to let things slide by the wayside. So sometimes we have to repeat things. So that's what he's doing. He says, nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. 
So some points Paul has written, he had to write them boldly and without reservation to remind them of what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to act, how they're supposed to treat others. He says, and I'm doing this because of the grace that was given to me from God. God has given Paul the grace in order to write to us, in order to pen to us this um, scripture so that we can be trained, so that we can be instructed. Because after all, the, the scripture is written for our instruction, is written to teach us, is written so that we will know who God is and what God expects. He said to be a minister of Christ to the Gentiles. So he says, I minister as a priest, the gospel of God. He said, it's my priestly duty to proclaim the gospel of God. So he says, I'm on a mission. It's what I've been tasked to do. We have all been tasked to minister, to be a minister of the gospel. You don't have to do it from the pulpit. You don't have to do it from a street corner, but we minister and we preach by our life. When we talk to others and we mention the gospel of Jesus Christ and how it has been applied to our lives and how it has helped us and build us up. That's how we minister. That's how we proclaim the gospel. And he said, proclaiming the gospel of God, that my offering of the Gentiles, what I've given to the Gentiles, may become acceptable to him, to God, sanctified, made holy, and set apart for his purpose by the Holy Spirit. Then in verse 17, it says, therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. So it is necessary for Jesus, it was necessary for Jesus to be like us, like his brothers, like his, his brethren, to come in the flesh so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. See, the priests of old, they had to go in and they had to make a sacrifice, an offering for themselves. And then they had to make an offering and sacrifice for the people. They had to first get cleansed themselves. And then they could make the offering or sacrifice for the people. But Jesus does not have to do that. Jesus is our high priest. He's our faithful high priest before God. He's our priest who is both merciful and gracious to us. And he's faithful. Jesus is faithful in dealing with God and he's faithful in dealing with the sins of the people. It's because of Jesus that many of us have not been cut off or were not cut off when we were out there committing so much sin. It's because of Jesus, because he is standing as a mediator, as a go-between between us and God. Then in verse 18, it says, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ had not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient and mighty signs and wonders by the power of the spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And I love this about Paul because Paul does not ever take glory for himself, but he directs everything back to God. Give God praise. Give him glory. Give him honor. He says, I know that they took apr the aprons off of me and they went and laid them on people and people were healed from diseases. People were delivered from demons. But he said, it's, it's nothing that I did, but it's all to the glory of God. And many preachers today will do good to read this over and over and get it in their spirit, never to take God's glory. God doesn't take it lightly when people take his glory, what belongs to him. So Paul says, I will dare. He says, I will dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me. He says, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that I did something when I didn't, or I'm not going to lie to you and say that what I did was all in my power and my authority, but it was all Christ who did it through me. And he said, these mighty signs and wonders that I did that was done through me was by the spirit of God. He said, it was only by the spirit of God that these things were done. So Paul says, I'm not going to even presume to speak of any thing except what Christ has done through me as an instrument in his hand. Paul said, I'm an instrument for Christ, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles to the gospel. So he says, because I was obedient to Christ, the obedience of the Gentiles have have come through the preaching of the gospel. 
And by these powers and signs and wonders, he says, and all of it, it was only through the power of the spirit of the living God. So Paul demonstrated that God had granted him apostolic power by the power of the Holy Spirit to do signs and wonders all for God's glory. And when we read back in Acts chapter 19, we talked about how unusual miracles were done by the hands of Paul. Remember, we talked about that and how handkerchiefs of aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and, and their illness was cured and they were delivered from evil spirit. See, these miracles that God did through Paul, because Paul was chosen by him to walk in, walk in apostolic anointing and that his power was greater than any work of darkness. God was proven through him because in that time, there was a lot of people that was doing sorcery and, and working in witchcraft as it is today. So don't get tripped up by what you see, by what looks like it is the spirit of the living God that's working. Don't get tripped up by people dancing and shouting in the church because the enemy, Satan, the Antichrist spirit knows how to shout, knows when to shout, knows how to dance, knows all these things. So don't get tripped up by these things because many people have. And they have been led astray. So these miracles that Paul is doing, Paul makes sure that he keeps his mind focused on the Lord, that he makes sure that he keeps pointing back to God to let people know it is only by the spirit of the living God that I'm able to do these things because he's doing them through me. Then in verse 20, it says, uh, Romans 15, verse 20, and it says, and so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel. Paul said, that's my goal. My goal is to preach the gospel. But he says, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. So Paul says, I don't want to go where Christ has already been preached, but my goal is to go where Christ has not been preached, to bring the gospel to those people who have not heard of the good news, who have not heard of the good news of Jesus Christ. Then he says, but as it is written, verse 21, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. So those people who had not heard, that's who he want to go to so that they can see, so that they can hear, they can comprehend, they can understand the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 22 says, for this reason, I also have much hindered from coming to you. I also have been much hindered from coming to you. So Paul says, this is the reason why I haven't come to you. I know I said I want to come to Rome. I know I had made plans to come to Rome. But he said, but this reason is what has kept me from, from coming to Rome because I've heard of the good report. I've heard of the good report of you and how well you are doing in in the body of Christ, how well you are applying scriptures. I understand all that and I've heard all those things. He says, so there's no need for me to rush to come to you, but where I need to go is to those people who have not heard the gospel, those people who are dying in their sin. I need to get to them to give them the gospel, the good news. He says, so that's where I'm focusing my attention on, on these people, on those areas, so that I can take the good news of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Then verse 23 says, but now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you. So Paul is saying, in these parts, I have I don't have a place. I don't have a place to preach the gospel because he told us a few verses up that he does not want to build on another one, on another man's foundation, on what another man has started. He wants to go to places where no one has been, where they have not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ yet. Whenever I journey to Spain, he says, verse 24, I shall come to you, for I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you. If first I may enjoy your company for a while. So Paul is, is letting them know that eventually I'm going to come to you. But we know that Paul, when he eventually gets there, he doesn't get there the way that he, he thought he was going to get there. We know that when he finally gets there, he's going to be a prisoner. So, verse 25, but now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. So, he's only, he says, I'm, I'm getting ready to go to Jerusalem to minister to the saints there. Then he says, verse 26, for it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia, to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. So Paul says, I'm going to Jerusalem to be a servant. I'm going to be a service to the believers at Jerusalem. He says, I'm taking the monetary contribution 
that came from Macedonia and Achaia. He said, this money I'm taking to them um, because it's their reasonable service. What they have collected, I'm taking to the church, to the believers in Jerusalem. Then he says, if, um, verse 27, it pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material or tangible things. So they were pleased to be able to send this money to them because they felt that they owed them and because they were also showing love. Then in verse 28, it says, Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. So he said, after I have completed the task or my mission at Jerusalem and have made sure that they have received this contribution, this money that had, was collected for them, that was raised for them, I will go to Spain and I will come and, uh, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way there. So then in verse 29, it says, but I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. So when, as I stated before, when Paul finally gets to Rome, he's going to get to testify in the emperor's court. If you remember when we read Acts 27 and 28, it talked about it there. But when he goes to Rome, he's going to go as a prisoner. So, He's going to go as a prisoner. I, I lost uh, what verse I was on. I'm sorry. Then in verse 30, it says, Now I beg or urge you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive or that you struggle with me together, with me in prayers to God for me. So Paul is asking for their prayers to cover him as he accomplishes the mission that God has given to him to do. Because Paul has made, by now, he's made a lot of enemies by now because he's no longer he's no longer um, going and, and getting Christians, getting those who are of the way. He's no longer going and imprisoning them, but he's going and preaching the gospel. So not only are, are people afraid of him that were... Um, the believers are afraid of him because they don't really know if he's really been changed. You have some that are still going to be afraid of him, but then you're going to also have those who he has turned his back on, so to speak, because he's no longer um, walking as a, a Pharisee. He's no longer walking in that type of arena. He stepped out of that because now he's walking for Jesus Christ. So he's got enemies on both sides. So he's asking for their prayers to cover him. Then verse 31, it says that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. So he says, I want you to pray for me because there are some that are in the Judea that do not believe. They don't believe that Jesus uh, rose from the dead. They don't believe that. They don't believe in the gospel. So these people may try to attack me. So I want you to pray for that God's anointing, that his presence, that his covering and protection will be on me. And that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. So he said that also that when I go to Jerusalem, that what I'm doing there, uh, the mission that I'm com to complete there will be accepted. Verse 32, he says that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed and find rest in your company together with you. So then verse 33, it says, now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So in conclusion, we are to accept Jesus' lordship in all areas of our life. Sometimes when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, there's areas in our life that we don't want him to touch. We said, keep out of that. When I got saved, there was areas I was like, mm -mm, you can't go in there. That lock is on there, and I'm the only one that has the key. I'm the only one that got the combination, and you're not getting in that room. But we have to accept Jesus' lordship in all areas of our life, even those areas that hurt. We've got to allow him in those areas because he's the only one that has the medicine. He's the only one that has the balm that is necessary in order to administer to that sore and that pain, that hurt, whatever it is, in order to um, get you to where you need to be, in order to stop the pain. You may still think about the thing, but the pain will be gone once Jesus administers his healing um, to it. So as we grow in faith and come to know Jesus, 
we become more capable of maintaining the mindset of Christ throughout each day. So when we get to know him more, when we get into his word, we get the capability, we get the power to be able to have the mindset of Christ throughout the day. So we've learned in this chapter that we are to be patient with those who are weaker or stronger in areas that we are or that we may not be. So I know I went over by a few minutes, So, but if there's any questions or comments at this time, I will open up the lines for you.